off of a record that I have back there. Um, I wrote it uh, right after the last time I was in Ireland. Um, all of the facts in this song are true. My, uh, my cousin, he studies uh, astrophysics. This song's about like stars. Am I allowed to swear in a song? Yeah. Just yeah. making sure. <laughs> um, this song's about stars and shit. And I sent him the lyrics, and he was like, very cheesy song, but the facts are true. And I was like, all right, well, good deal. Cool. The song's called Planetarium.
different event for you this month. Um, it's something that we've been thinking about doing for a while, um, and it's something that some of the other cities around the world have done, where we put a call out at the start of the month to our Creative Mornings community here in Dublin and asked for submissions. Um, we had almost 50 of them. So it was very difficult to choose, but we whittled it down to six speakers. Um, so each person has two minutes to um, tell you a story about something that's important to them. Um, so please be generous with your applause and be nice to them. So first up is Jane Gleason. Thanks, Lily and Aiden. Um, so I'm one of the 70% of people who are incredibly afraid of public speaking, so I'm just going to put that out there before I start talking. Um, so I am a marketing... No, I'm going to just click your slide. I'm sorry. My fault. So I'm a marketing and events manager, and I usually put people up on these stages as opposed to speaking on one. So this, as I said, is terrifying. Um, but the reason this event piqued my interest was because I work in marketing and communications. I spend a lot of my time online and on social media. So I really value the importance of engaging at real life events like this. Um, and so for the purpose of that, I ask all of you to try just for the next, I don't know, 20 minutes, 12, 13, 14 minutes, to put your phone away and just enjoy the talk tech free. Um, and I was reminded recently of not having the crutch of top technology when on a Saturday morning I was putting something out in the bin and I was in my pyjamas and of course, would, as luck would have it, I locked myself out. <laughs> and I'm pretty new to the area so I don't know my neighbours and luckily enough one of my neighbours ran out, she heard my door and she was so nice and she was like, oh, you know, ring your boyfriend, try to yeah, let him back or get him to let you back in. Or he wasn't inside, he was at the shop. But um, I don't know his number, my phone was inside the house, so, you know, I could just be like, yeah, it's 085, and that's it. <laughs> um, so she stood there for like 20 minutes and she chatted to me and she told me all about the gossip of the area. She told me about this yoga class down the road and I had actually been looking for a yoga class. And she was super nice and it was just really lovely to engage with one of my neighbours and actually get to know them. And I do really think that if I had my phone on me in that situation, I would have sat there scrolling through social media unnecessarily, learning absolutely nothing and gaining nothing from it. So I guess the importance of that situation, I felt really included and invited into a community that I had just become a part of. And I think that events like Creative Mornings are even more cru crucial for situations like that. Um, so if there is one thing that I can ask you to take away from this very bite-sized two-minute talk, it's try to get yourself locked out of your house more often. <laughs> or at least try and put your phone away a little bit more often and reignite the human conversation. How's it going, guys? Okay. Yeah. How's it going, guys? Uh, my name's Corrado D. I'm an artist uh, based around mines in Dublin. And I mainly work through the mediums of uh, gouache, colouring pencil, and watercolour. As you can see here, I do some kind of gallery based stuff and some street art based stuff. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the use of negative life experience in your work to bring something positive to it. So in about 2013 I began to experience panic attacks and if you don't know about them before you start having them they're really overwhelming and you're kind of you know you're kind of freaking out all, all the time and I knew I needed to use my art practice to reframe my experience. So the next time I was having a panic attack, similar to right now, I'd look at what was around me. So, you know, I'd be like, oh God, and see somebody's, you know, expression, like maybe a side eye glance or an interesting object. And I begin to like do quick drawings or take some photos. So then with this, I bring all this information back to the studio and start arranging them in, into pieces. So a good example of that is this piece here, which I don't know how well you can see. But it's uh, based on a visit I took to Ridley Market in London. It's very new to London, I just moved over there, very stressed out. A lot of strong smells, a lot of inedible fish knocked around the market. <laughs> so I was like, Jesus. And then, you know, I was kind of trying to fiddle my camera, and then a group of lads was kind of giving me shits. So I was like, oh fuck. So I did a bit of another laugh while struggling to take photos. So it was just a good example of how this technique manifested. And then I began, began to call them rounds. 
So each series, each picture in the series would become a round. And I suppose I'll finish in saying that, you know, we all go through shit at one stage in our lives or the other, and, you know, it can be very difficult to deal with. But if you can channel that, you know, great emotion in that struggle into something, it can be a really powerful thing. Thanks very much, guys. Oh. Uh, I'm a brand strategist and researcher. You can find out more about me down at the bottom if you like. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about is about climate change and frustration and rising temperatures that were really getting me really frustrated about a year ago. Um, so I set up almost on a whim a little group on Facebook uh, called Kinder to Earth. It's a group where we share ideas and it's turned in, shares like share ideas about how we could be kinder to earth. It's grown into uh, something that uh, we've got people from all, from every continent on it. Uh, we support each other, uh, we back each other up. There are lots of people who share a lot and there are people who lurk, but they tell me in person that they get something out of it. Um, so that's an online community. Um, and then the offline community, it led me to Estonia where I was got involved in World Cleanup Day. So World Cleanup Day is the is, is set to be the biggest civic movement um, on the planet. So tens of millions of people in about 150 countries are going to take part in World Cleanup Day on the 15th of September this year. So if you could imagine, it's like a massive Mexican wave from uh, Japan all the way to Hawaii of people cleaning up. So in the run up to this event, um, I've been organizing cleanups and getting involved in cleanups and they are really great. I've done more than I really needed to do because people enjoy them. We feel part of something. We're actually hot and sweaty <laughs> after picking up rubbish, um, but we've done something really tangible. Uh, you know, we get extra ice in our drinks afterwards um, and I suppose what I want to do is encourage people, if you do have time or you are interested, please get in touch. Um, but in the run-up to this talk, if I've got a second, I was thinking about what community is and what it's about. And I think that there is an alchemy with community. There is a magic in it that transforms us. Um, it makes us stronger. It gives us a place where we can share our worries, our frustrations, our anger. Um, it gives us the resilience to keep going. And I think that communities transform us and then they give us the platform that we can uh, transform the worlds that we live in. <laughs> Bang on time! <laughs>
35 years later, uh, I've been involved in numerous projects, uh, national, local, regional, national and international. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Angels Beacons of Hope, which is a project I started in about 2008. The reason I started it was, 2008 was a very, very low time in Ireland's history. Very depressing. Uh, you couldn't escape the negativity. And I came home one night to my wife and three young children and I said, this is a disgrace. Somebody should do something about the negativity. And as I heard myself say those words, I realized, actually, it's me. So I was thinking, how would you communicate hope? What would hope look like? So I came up with an idea, uh, a, a, an, an angel, which I thought was originally a, 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 um, a religious icon. It actually turns out that a uh, concept of angels has existed for many, many uh, thousands of years. So I, I had a friend of mine and myself who designed a contemporary designed angel. We, we manufactured 52 of them. We gifted them to organizations and individuals in Ireland who represent hope. And they also, the whole idea was to try and encourage ordinary people and ordinary individuals and organizations. So you obviously need some celebrities to get some media. Now back, by the way, 10 years ago, social media didn't really exist. So what we achieved was pretty uh, impressive. So what we did was we had 52 angels. I'm just gonna tell you very quickly about Ordinary people, the stories behind their designs was quite extraordinary and much more Im Im impressive and inspirational than the celebrities that were involved. No offense to the celebrities. So on the left hand side here is uh, an angel which I delivered to the women's prison in Dublin City and everyone got the same instruction. Here's an angel of hope, it's a blank canvas, show Ireland what hope looks like. 24, and everyone got six weeks and a paint pack. So six weeks, sorry, 24 hours later, I get a phone call from the prison to say the angel's finished. I said, you're kidding. Went in, the angel has been painted black with a message to say, tell that baldy guy, there's no hope in prison. And I said, the, guy, the girls have got the wrong end of the stick here, they need to think about this. Anyway, they came back with this idea. By the way, this is a really short, uh, um, short story. I'm kidding. <laughs> Who wants to hear the rest of the story? <laughs> There's only four. You're breaking the rooms, uh, now. You're uh, breaking the rooms. Ah, right, okay. Go on. Bottom line <laughs> is, these, these women thought about uh, what hope looked like. And six weeks later, they came back with this beautiful pink angel. And on the belly of the angel, they wrote the Michelangelo quote, which he said about his statue, David, he said, I saw an angel in the stone and I carved it to set it free. They changed one thing, they changed the word saw to see, because they said that after six weeks of working on this project, they could see a future for themselves. So the message is that if you're in a community of any type, you really should be putting something back into it. For the minimum. Morning everyone, uh, this is not a sales pitch. Uh, so I want to talk about fulfillment. How fulfilled is everyone what they're doing at the moment? Yes. <laughs> Just have a think about that, let that sit with you. So what I want to talk to you today is about the Japanese way of living called Ikigram, standing in front of the slides, sorry, rule one on one. Um, it is a way of living that's originated in Okinawa in Japan and I don't know if you know this but they have the highest life expectancy of anywhere in the world so there are simple principles that they follow that can be applied to business as well um, and in terms of fulfillment personally there's a great sense of fulfillment when you can source develop and grow business and retain business um, I learned my craft in advertising and research um, I'm a strategic planner and what I'm doing now is I'm blending data analytics with traditional research which I've always found has, has done me well in my career and helped me to, to stand out. So firstly, when you're thinking about what you want to do, and I saw this in a presentation from somebody yesterday in the tower building who was very focused on their strengths and that's the first thing that's important in terms of Ikigai um, if you follow this principle. So I've always been good at research and presentation. So that would be something that I have continued throughout and something that people have commented on. The next thing then is about your passion for what you're doing. So at times what I'm doing doesn't feel like work and I'm prepared to put the extra work in. 
And it's also important then to give yourself a bit of downtime and to appreciate that sometimes when you're working in an agency, you don't get that downtime. Um, and productivity doesn't, necessar doesn't necessarily mean that you're busy. Um, the next thing then is about reward. So if you look up Ikigai online, you'll see it's usually in a Venn diagram type and it's based on four areas. So the next thing then is about, can you actually make money out of what you're doing? So there's definitely a market and there's definitely money in the research area, which I've decided to focus on. Um, and then the profession. So is it something that you can carry on? And I think that that's definitely something that, uh, that I've been doing, that I've been able to prove myself to clients that this is something that I'm good at because I focused on uh, what, I'm, what, my, what my strengths are. Um, so that's pretty much it. I was just trying to finish in the two minutes, but uh, if anyone wants to ask anything at the end, just come up. Thanks very much.